Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Zwingli United Church of Christ. Uh, for those who are here this morning, as well as those who are on Facebook live stream, I ask that sometime during the service that you fill out the welcome sheets at the end of your rows and pass those along to your neighbor. And those on Facebook live stream, please make sure you register or chat or do whatever so that we know that you are with us. Um, I want to thank Carol Mattis as well as Lori Reynolds for helping out though, with the service this morning while uh, Pastor Allen is away. And um, actually, we have a video from the youth that we are going to show now. So, it's a very short one, uh, so make sure you pay attention. going to be a test in just a minute. <laughs> they just talked about how they're having so much fun. And if you've been paying attention to Facebook um, and some of the posts, um, there's been posts from uh, some of the uh, adult leaders on what they've been doing each day. And I, I have to admit, I loved uh, what was happening with the Burns family because Jason is away. And so uh, uh, the, he got an update of all the highlights of what was happening um, in Kira and, Beth, and Beth's life. So that was a wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. So... Um, that leads us into the prayer request. We're not going to have a prayer for the mission trip participants in the beginning of the service. They will be prayed for a little bit later. And so that's going to be one of our prayer requests today is uh, just prayers for uh, the, those who are on the mission trip as they return for safe travels. Um, I think they were in Akron overnight and um, they will be leaving at some point today. Maybe they have already left. It's nine o'clock. They probably haven't. Um, so if it came to a vote, they haven't left yet. Um, so, uh, but they will be traveling today. Prayers for them. And we were really excited to hear that Pastor Allen was able to go out and join them on Thursday. And so you probably saw him with a big smiley face uh, in the pictures on Facebook. So that was really great. So I want to share with you quite a number of prayer requests this morning. Um, I have a prayer request for my cousin, Donna Reynolds-Dean. Um, they did discover that she has a melanoma tumor behind her left eye. And um, she will be coming to Will's Eye in Philadelphia. And so she'll be coming for the first time this coming Monday. Um, and then we'll find out from there what she will be doing and when surgery may be. And it may even be that day. I'm not sure. Also, prayers for Isla Belcher, a one-year-old daughter of Aaron and Brendan Belcher. Aaron is Aaron Detweiler Belcher. And so um, Isla has been in the hospital with a blood infection um, at Lehigh Valley. And so prayers for her as she continues to recover. It sounds like she is doing pretty well now. And so uh, that's a good thing. Uh, but continued prayers for her as well as for Aaron and Brendan and for Dave and Julie Detweiler. Also, prayers for Jen Sergio, a dear friend of Christy Reef. Uh, we prayed for her before because she was diagnosed with stage 4 esophageal cancer. Uh, she was recently admitted to the ICU at St. Luke's and will need a tracheostomy. And so prayers for her. This is a really difficult journey for her. And esophageal cancer is a really, really tough one. So prayers for her as she uh, deals with that. And prayers for her family and those that love her and support her. Also, we have continued prayers for John Reynolds. Uh, John was in the hospital. He was in the hospital in um, Minnesota while they were there for a wedding. And so um, while the wedding was going on, he was in the hospital, was able to come home, uh, had another medical procedure done and uh, is recovering well. And so prayers for John as he recovers and also as he continues to recover uh, with his hand. Um, that he'll get full strength and use of the hand as well. And also a prayer this morning for the continuing stroke recovery for Carol Mattis's friend, Jimmy. And Jimmy has an interesting prayer too for the development of a single dose pill that will help with recovery uh, for strokes. And as someone who has had a family members with a number of strokes uh, and well acquainted with that, I am in full agreement with him. Uh, for any and everything that we can discover that will help people dealing with those kinds of issues. Also, we have some joys this morning. A happy eighth birthday to Harrison and Alina Neff. That's wonderful. Eight years old. I 
don't think I'll ever remember that age again, but that's wonderful. Happy birthday to both of you, that's great. And then we also heard that, uh, I get, think it was last night at 9.50 p.m., Benjamin Paul Schnorr was born to Nancy Schnorr. Uh, father is Greg, and proud grandparents are Mark and Gail Comden. So we can call Mark Grandpa. That's <laughs> wonderful. I heard we can't call Gail Grandma, but that's all right. <laughs> that's okay. Yes, we can. We can. So those are all the prayers uh, today, our prayer requests today. Again, if you have any prayer requests during the week, please, please do not hesitate to be in contact with the church office or with me or Pastor Allen. So let us now open our hearts and our minds and our souls that we might receive the spirit that is here with us as we worship God together. Let us pray. God of growth and new beginnings, enter into the struggles of our lives. Nurture our souls that we may be fertile ground for wisdom and love to spring forth in our lives. Dwell within us that we may have strength of purpose to live out your calling each and every day. Let the word of your scriptures and the teaching of your Son, Jesus, be a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please join in our confession. God of unity and peace, we know that we are not always a peaceful people. Where there is conflict, help us to find your peace. Where we feel envy, help us to know your soothing balm of acceptance. When we are overcome with anger, 
Grant us the grace of forgiving hearts. When we have caused conflict and pain, forgive us. Help us to grow as disciples of love and peace in all that we say and do. Those who abide in the Spirit have been set free. Those who are in Christ find no condemnation. As forgiven people made new in God's Spirit, rejoice in the fertile ground of God's love and mercy. Amen. gather this day in the peace of Christ, and so I say to you, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us share Christ's peace with one another. Well, good morning, birthday children. How is it? How's it feel to be eight? Good. Oh, look at everybody. Hi, guys. How's everybody? Good to see everyone. I have, today we're going to talk about a parable. And a parable is a story Jesus told about how to live your life. And oftentimes these stories were told about things that didn't really they weren't actually what he was saying, you know? So he had some ideas and he wanted you to understand them because things that you knew about in those days, people were farmers and they knew about sowing seeds. So this is called the parable of the sower. And I have for you each four seeds All right, has anyone ever heard this parable before, this story? Okay, so let me go over this story because this is one that I've heard a lot. Notice I don't even have any notes because I know it. So there were four, uh, there was a farmer and the farmer was out to sow his seeds or her seeds. And the first seeds, she threw out onto a path. And do you know what? Those seeds were picked up by the birds. The birds just ate them all up, so they didn't grow. The second time the farmer threw out his seeds, he threw them into rocks. And those rocks, of course, they grew very fast, very quickly. But because there was no soil, unfortunately, they withered away. The third time he threw out his seeds, he threw them out, and it was nice, nice soil. But there were weeds that came up. And if you know about weeds, they will smother your plant. Yes. Yes. So finally, the farmer threw out the seeds on beautiful, well-tended, fertilized soil. And Kira, just like you said, they grew into beautiful plants. So from this story, we want to understand 
understand that the seeds are God's word and the soils are our hearts. And sometimes when we hear God's word, we have those hearts like, like this, hard as rock. The bitter and angry. Have you ever had an angry heart? Like you're really mad about something? Well, that's, I wish I could say that. <laughs> but sometimes then when you hear God's word, you can't even think about it. It's, I don't even want to hear it. Sometimes we hear God's word and it's like being in those rocks. And in those rocks, we get so excited about hearing the word of God and we go, yes, 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 I'm going to do that. And then you know what happens? We forget about it. And finally, and then if we sometimes hear it and we think that this is the best thing I've ever heard, and then those weeds come up and we forget about it too. But when we hear God's word and our heart is so open and ready to receive it and listen, it's like that good soil. And when we plant our what we hear in Sunday school and in church, in good soil, we grow into the people that God wants us to be. So I hope you'll take these seeds and plant them at home in good soil and tend them. And every time you look at the pretty flowers that come out, that you think about your relationship with God and listening and hearing God's word. Let's pray. Dear God, let us be the farmer who sows his seeds in good soil so that we may listen and hear in our hearts the word of Christ and God and be the people he wants us to be. Amen. Thank you. Our Hebrew Bible lesson this morning is following along the seeds line from Isaiah, the 55th chapter, beginning in the 10th verse. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar, shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off.
Thank you, Charlotte. That was beautiful. Um, and I don't want to betray your age, but how many years have you been singing, would you say? 80, at least? 80 years or more. Thank you, Jesus. Seriously. Our gospel lesson this morning is found in Matthew, the uh, gospel according to Matthew in the 13th chapter, and we'll begin with the first verse of that chapter. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky grounds, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no roots, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. And after saying some words to the disciples about why he spoke in parables, Jesus said these words to them to explain the parable. Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. That is what is sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no roots, but endures for only a little while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word out, and it yields nothing. But as for what is sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, and indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. May God add a blessing to the hearing and reading of God's holy word. I want to thank Lori for her sermon this morning. Uh, so I'll tell you that many times you will hear several sermons during a service, and that was one of them. And you're going to hear some of the same things in this sermon. And I want to know, I know that the kids may not have heard this, uh, the uh, parable of the sower, but how many of you here know the parable of the sower or have heard it before? Have heard the parable of the sower. And how many have not heard the parable of the sower before? Wow, okay. So few of you have not heard the parable. Well, if you come here, you'll hear it at least every three years. Um, and um, it's, it, it is a story that I've heard um, quite a lot since I was a kid. Um, and it's a pretty well-known parable, not as well-known as some of like the Christmas stories that, there, that we read, but the parable by many of us have been heard over and over and over again. And in this case, Jesus explains the parable, which is really unusual because Jesus usually doesn't do that, but he does it in this case to help out the disciples and also help out us a little to understand what the parable all, is all about. And even though he explains it, though, Christians, scholars, others have been wrestling with the words and meaning of this parable since he spoke them. So let's take another look. Because sometimes it's here, it's good hearing stories over and over again and learning from them again and learning really important things about our faith from this particular story. Now, there's a lot of ways that we can go with this parable, a lot of ways we can talk about it, just as we've said in many a sermon, there's many directions that we can go. But this morning, I wanna talk a little bit about how we receive this, how we receive the word of God, and also how we share the word of God, or how it is planted, as was said in the uh, children's moment this morning, how it's planted in our hearts, and how we might plant it in the world. First of all, we want to wonder a little bit about the sower, because how the sower sows the seeds. 
right? Uh, perhaps he was, that's how they planted seeds back in the day, way back then when Jesus was telling the story. Maybe that's exactly what they did, and, and maybe that is what they did. But these days, and if Harold and Pat were here, they could probably tell us, that's not how you plant seeds today. And I remember seeing my father going out and tilling the soil, cultivating the soil, making sure that everything was just right for the soil, and then making ridges so that he could plant the seeds in just the right place, or plant the bulb, or plant the plant in just the right place. There wasn't any haphazard kind of planting at, the, at my house when my dad did a garden there. And when I look and I pass by where they're putting, you know, getting the fields ready for planting, and if you look at the rows and rows of corn, that's not really haphazard, right? It's like rows and rows of corn. It's like rows and rows of pews. So I don't know what's going on with the sower just kind of throwing seed wherever the sower wants to uh, throw things. So a farmer today, I don't think, would ever try to throw seed on a path or in rocky ground or amid the thorns, but would only try to do that on good cultivated soil. So what's going on here? But I also know that planting can be a little bit more haphazard. Sally tells me that there are flower bulbs that she has planted all over our yard in places she does not even remember. And she's not quite sure where they will appear. And I can witness to this fact that that's very true. They pop up, flowers pop up in just the oddest places. But whenever they emerge, they are beautiful. They're incredible, and they really bring joy to your heart. I also think about the cherry tomato plants in our garden. Now, we don't plant a lot of other fruits and vegetables, but we do have cherry tomato plants, and we really don't grow them. For years, they've just sort of popped up in one place or another, like we planted them originally, but all of a sudden, about 10 feet away, another plant would show up. And they just kind of show up all over the place. So we're never quite sure where they will turn up. And some tomato plants seem like they will indeed produce a hundredfold. Too many cherry tomatoes to eat. It's an amazing thing to see and to watch. But one of the things about the flowers and tomato plants, it usually takes relatively good soil for them to grow and thrive. So I kind of wondered about this. This sower is throwing seed all over the place. And I kind of wondered about what kind of God makes sure that the gospel doesn't just happen to fall in good soil, but is spread all around. And it began to make me think about how God keeps giving us the word in so many different ways. We don't get it just in the Bible or in the hymns or in a sermon or in many other ways that we might find in the church. We don't get God's word just in so many certain ways in the, in the world in which we go out. We don't get the word of God just in the ways that we serve. But there are so many different ways that God will cast the seed of the gospel into our lives. And sometimes, as we know, we'll get it, and other times we won't. In his book, New Seeds of Contemplation, Thomas Merton says this, Every moment and every event of every person's life on earth plants something in her or his soul. For just as the wind carries thousands of winged seeds, so each moment brings with it germs of spiritual vitality that come to rest imperceptibly in the minds and wills of women and men. Most of these unnumbered seeds perish and are lost. For such seeds as these cannot spring up anywhere except in the good soil of freedom, spontaneity, and love. I like what he says about this. That we're also receiving all these different kinds of seeds all the time from God. They, they are cast about in so many different ways, and there are some times when the soil is good, when the soil of freedom, spontaneity, and love exists, that we are able to receive these seeds. Freedom in Christ. Not a freedom to do what we want, but a freedom to be what God has called us to be. Spontaneity. That's something that I certainly could use a lot more of, but sometimes it's just 
it's a good thing for us to think outside the box, which I feel like we try to do many times at Swingley. Sometimes we try to plant things in really nice rows. We try to do things just the right way. But at other times, God says, hey, open the door. Open the door of your hearts and make sure you not only let me in, but that you also look at what I'm calling you to do through the gospel that I have given to you as a gift. And love. Love is at the center of everything. That is one of the hardest things for us to learn and for us to practice and for us to do. But in that soil of freedom and spontaneity and love, can we in fact make sure that we are able to grow those things that God has called us to grow, where our yield will be 30-fold, 100-fold. So what else does this um, parable tell us about receiving the word of God, the word of Christ? What is... What are we told in the scripture about the soil that we look at? Now, there is a really good explanation of that in the children's moment, but permit me to say a few other things too, because that's what pastors do, right? You know, you don't uh, give a pastor something to say and then don't let the pastor say it. So I'm gonna say it this morning. So that's it, let's take a look at these soils. First, the seed on the path. Okay, now, um, I started looking at this in a little different way. I want to know how many of you have ever read scripture passages that left you scratching your head. Yeah? You mean all the others who didn't raise your hand, you understand the scripture perfectly? Here. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I, I've read many a passage, and I've even after even after I've read what other people have said about it, I'm like, I, I still don't get it. I'm not sure if I really understand this. And sometimes the seed of the gospel finds its way on the hard path of my soul and heart. Doesn't mean I won't ever get it again, but sometimes that's how it happens. Sometimes it's hard to discern what's best to do. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what scripture says or what another word of God or of Christ might say in other ways that we receive it. I've sung hymns where I don't get the words. They don't really resonate with me. I've sung other hymns and songs where it comes immediately and you feel it deeply within your heart and soul. And so sometimes I feel like when it falls on the path, you know, it's not just the evil one at work, it's just me. It's just us and some of the ways in which we encounter whatever we're hearing or experiencing. I also know that the soil of my heart and soul is not always so fertile. In fact, my inner terrain can be rocky and thorny and shallow so often, and maybe more often than it, it is fertile soil for Jesus and the gospel. I know that I can be lured by the temptations of the American dream and the luxuries of American life. We fall into those things so easily we don't even think about them. And many times it kind of skews how we see the gospel. I find that a lot of things that are happening in the Christian world, it's because we are getting lured by the wrong things, like power, or keeping people in their place, or believing we have to be police for God's kingdom. So when we do things like that, I feel like we're being lured by the power of the world that we're not really listening to what the gospel is telling us about having an open heart. The weeds of fear and thorns of doubt are ever present. And I'm ashamed at the number of faith practices I've been excited about and been abandoned over the years. And that doesn't include my struggles with how best to be a Christian in the world, like when I see someone who's homeless and in need or fail to make a call to someone in the hospital that I should have called weeks ago, or that I've judged too quickly what other people have done. But I'm sure none of you have ever had to struggle with that. The cares of the world are also a concern, and there are a lot of them. Hunger and homelessness, racism, homophobia, mistreatment of women, those who take advantage of others so easily. We just read stories this past week 
that breaks your heart about how people take advantage of others. And these are matters of the heart. And we need to do whatever we can to cultivate the good soil in our own hearts because that is what is needed to combat these other things that are not of God, are absolutely not. So this good soil, how do we cultivate this good soil in our hearts and our lives out in the world? And how do we cast seeds of the kingdom out of the world? How do we get all of that together? Well, I think we've said many of these things before, and we could come up with examples this morning, like worship and daily prayer, listening to God. I mean, really, worship, daily prayer, listening to God. Reading scripture, being part of the prayer circle that meets on Wednesday, being a part of some other ministry that, um, that, that we have at Zwingli or that we're a part of out in the community. Because all of that will help you to cultivate your heart, will help to cultivate the good soil of your heart and soul. But there's not only lessons about receiving and cultivating, there's also lessons about how we share this gospel in the world. As I thought about this part of it, I thought immediately of the youth, right? This morning we saw the youth and we've seen pictures of them and um, it's been wonderful to see. It's wonderful to see them doing ministry that God has called them to do. That maybe they decided to go on this trip because they knew it might be fun and a bonding experience, but I also could see all of the good work and all of the good seeds of the kingdom that they have planted. If you want to know how to spread God's seed, God's word out into the world, just look at what the youth have done. Not only on this mission trip, but when they've been in front of us during worship, or when they've done so many other wonderful things throughout my experience here at Zwingli. It's an amazing thing to watch. It's not only out of the mouth of babes, but we are learning from their faith. I also think of our being witness to the ONA covenant and the many different things that we have done with that. The ways in which we try to open the doors, open our hearts, making sure that we spread the seed of the gospel whenever and wherever we can, making sure that people know that they are loved and accepted and cared for here, and that they are also invited to be a people who are struggling each day, but are also striving to be Christ's disciples. I can think of no better call than that. But there's so many other things that are done through this church, like the Beanbag Project, or people who might work with Emmanuel Lutheran down the road, or have worked at Keystone Opportunity Center. Or when we hear a song from someone who's been singing for over 80 years. That's how you share the gospel. That's how you plant the seeds of God's word in the world. Many of the people I know that live or have lived inspirational lives have been like the sower in the parable. Although they have worked hard to cultivate the soil and allow the gospel of love to grow within them, and sometimes they're really careful about the things that they do, many times they are less concerned about their planting practices. They are less concerned about being careful with love or offering food to those in need, just making sure it just goes to the people they think it should go to, they go out and they just do it. It's like Pastor Heitker said when I talked to him about what they were doing at Emmanuel Luther, and he says, here, no one asks the people coming for their green card or for the different things that they are asked to fill out or do any and every other place. They just come and receive food. That's an amazing, an amazing witness to what it means to cast the seed of Christ's gospel in the world. They're less concerned about being careful with love or offering food to those in need or providing a listening ear 
or helping others see the radical claims of the gospel. They know that the love will not always be received, that the gift will, all, will not always be received in a way that they may want, that the gospel message that they are casting about will take root, but the people that are really in tune with what God is calling them to be, that doesn't allow them to stop doing what God has called them to do, to cast the gospel into the world, to cast love into the world, to not let what others might do or how they react to stop them from continuing to cultivate the soil of God's love. I wonder if we were all like that, if we were all like the sower in the parable, that we were willing to scatter the seed of the gospel wherever and whenever, and then hope for the best. I wonder what would happen if we sort of did things that way. Would we be able to rely on God? Would we have enough faith and trust to know that God would give the increase? Are we willing to speak and live the gospel no matter where we are or who we might be with? I've heard stories of people here who have been confronted with those who are saying some things that aren't so nice, and then they begin to speak with a calm voice. They begin to speak with a spirit within them that they may not have knew they had. And before you know it, hearts might be changed. And even if they're not, they're still casting the seed of the gospel what God has called them to do. One commentator I read said that these texts shatter the structure of my unbelief, my idolatrous hold on my own interpretation of the world, my own despair at the lack of the world's possibilities. These parables say to me that this is not a closed system, but one open to its creator, whose possibilities are endless. So just as we serve a God whose possibilities are endless, we are called to cultivate a heart that is open to those possibilities. For as God said through the prophet Isaiah, I love this passage, for as the rain, outside, as the snow came down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and, ex and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Wow, what a promise. That's an incredible vision, an incredible way to describe the ministry that we are a part of. And we can help God to plant the seeds. Others may water it, as Paul once said in Scripture, but God will give the increase and will accomplish what God intends. Even when there are weeds and thorns and hard paths and rocky ground all around, God will find a way. Just as you see that little flower sometimes growing between the cracks of semen, God will find a way. So may we all cultivate the good soil of our hearts. And may we cultivate the good soil in the world as we strive to do God's will and as we strive to be Christ's followers. Amen.
And let us now affirm our faith together. You, O oh God, are supreme and holy. You create our world and give us life. Your purpose overarches everything we do. You have always been with us. You are God. You, O oh God, are infinitely generous, good beyond all measure. You came to us before you came to you. You have revealed and proved your love for us in Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again. You are with us now. You are God. You, O oh God, are Holy Spirit. You empower us to be your gospel in the world. You reconcile and heal. You overcome death. You are our God. We worship you. Please be seated. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, as ever, we are thankful for the opportunity to be here, to worship together, to fellowship with one another, to grow in our faith, to listen to your word that is scattered into our hearts and the many ways in which we hear that word, whether it be in a song that is sung, a hymn that we sing together, whether it be in scripture or in the sermon, or it might, it, it might be in the way that uh, someone has talked to us um, especially when we are in need or in ways that we reach out to others. In so many ways, O oh God, your gospel, especially your gospel of love, is cast about. May we, O oh God, indeed be a people who cultivate our hearts so that they might be open to your word, and that we will be a people as well that will also share this gospel, that we will share the seeds of the gospel with the world, no matter where we are, no matter who we meet. Give us courage, O oh God, because it will take courage, especially in a world that often resists the gospel, resists your love. Help us, O oh God, in the midst of that resistance to have courage and faith and perseverance and especially love. As we gather together today, O oh God, we offer our prayers as well, prayers for those that we love, Prayers sometimes for those we may not even know. And so we, all, we pray especially today for Donna Reynolds Dean, that you will be with her and calm her spirit, that her faith in you will be ever present as she walks this journey. May you be with her as she go, comes to Philadelphia and as her family surrounds her and her friends, she goes through what she needs to go through. We pray this day for Isla Belcher, far too young to be in the hospital for a week, but also someone surrounded by love and care and by your care and love. We thank you for the healing that has happened, but we also pray for her continued healing, that she will be home and home soon. We pray especially, too, for Aaron and for Brendan and for Dave and for Julie, because this is indeed, has been a scary time, I'm sure. We also pray this day for Jen Sergio, also going through what must be a horrific time. Not only dealing with stage four esophageal cancer, but recently going to the ICU and needing to tracheostomy. May you be with her friends and family, especially Christy. May you be with them, those who love her, that they will offer her the care and concern that she needs that just by their presence, they will be casting the seeds of the gospel into her life. And may she find some calm, and may she find some confidence in your care. We also pray this day for John, for all the things that he has had to deal with over the past year, for the struggles that he's had to endure, for missing out on a wedding, for all of those things that, um, you know, just make life just wonderful. I know for him that he's had to take a step back. May you continue to heal him in body and in soul. And even though that he's suffered these different things, we also know that he continues to work, that he continues to reach out to others, that he continues to show kindness and to spread 
in his own way the seeds of the gospel. We pray this day, O oh God, for our youth and for the leaders, for Pastor Allen, for all of the ways in which they have um, done what you have called them to do this week. May you bring them home safely. May we have open ears and open hearts as we hear about the things that they have done. And may it inspire us that we might be your servants in the world. We give thanks for birthdays, especially the eighth birthday of Harrison and Alina. That is so wonderful. We hope that they had or that they will have a really good day. We are thankful that we can celebrate their birth. We can celebrate their life. And help us, O oh God, to celebrate the life not only of them, but of all the children and youth in our care. That we will not only be witnesses to them, that we will not only be mentors to them, that we will not only be examples to them about how to live a life of faith, but we will also watch them because they have much to teach us. We thank you, O oh God, today for the birth of Benjamin Paul Schnorr. Ah, such a wonderful thing to celebrate. We ask that you be with Nancy and with Greg and with grandparents and other family as they not only celebrate this joyous occasion, but also as they ready for what comes next. We are thankful for the life that you give, the life that you have given to us in Jesus Christ, who also taught us to pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today we've been talking really about gifts, the gifts of God that has been given to us. But God also calls us to give back. God calls on us to be faithful servants. So let us now give back not only of our treasure, but also of our lives.
Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for your steadfast love and generous compassion. We thank you for the gifts of this earth. As we share our gifts, help us know the fulfillment of generous giving and grateful living. Use these offerings to further the ministry of your church in a world in need of compassion, justice, and peace. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Please be seated. I invite you uh, to take a look at the announcements at the end of your bulletin, uh, but also want to highlight a few. Uh, one is Christmas in July, and you'll see in your bulletin, I don't have my answer, but I think you have a multicolored insert in the bulletin about Christmas in July and some uh, different, uh, different, kind, different uh, mission and ministry that you can uh, uh, help to support. And so please take a look at that, and if you are able, please give to one of the concerns that we've listed uh, in, on that insert. Also, next week, next week is the service at Percasey Park. Um, and so we will be worshiping together with Trinity UCC and Ridge Valley UCC, as well as uh, the residents of the park who will be attending that service. So I hope that you will come. And I also hope that if you do come, that you'll stay after for the potluck picnic. And if you stay for the potluck picnic, we ask you to please, please sign up. There's a sign-up sheet. Um, it was really good last week. I guilted enough people into doing that. And if I haven't guilted you yet, I'm guilting you now. Please sign up for the picnic um, for the Percasey Park service. But whether you can come to the picnic or not, I hope that you can come to the service. It's a really wonderful gathering of several different churches as well as the good folk at uh, Percasey Park. Also, uh, there's an announcement on pages 12 and 13, I believe, about Vacation Bible School. And so if you know of any um, youth or children who would like to be a part of that, please make sure that they get registered. Uh, that will be happening uh, pretty soon, in a few weeks, I think. And so please make sure uh, registration. Um, and I don't know if there's a need for people to help out, but if that's in there, please make sure you do that too. So those are all the announcements I have to share with you this morning. And so now let us stand and sing our closing hymn, number 318. 